Thanks, John. If you live in a multifamily building, an elevator is usually a necessary part of your life. Some people love them, some hate them, and some actually fear them. In fact, there's a term for that, elevatobia. Oops, I, by the way, just so you know, Todd, I'm the one that normally screws up, so the editing is always with me. Okay, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start that over. No problem. If you live in a multifamily building, an elevator is usually a necessary part of your life. Some people love them, some hate them, and some actually fear them. In fact, there's a term for that, elevatophobia. One thing is certain, elevators require consistent updates and maintenance to remain safe and aesthetically pleasing. Our guest today, Todd Schwartz, has worked for Otis, Thyssen Krupp, and Ace Elevator Companies before founding his current company, Connections Elevator, in 2011. Todd and I will also be discussing his new venture with electric vehicle charging stations. Todd is a native Floridian. He is a graduate of the University of Florida, as well as a graduate of the University of Miami Business School. Todd, welcome to Take It to the Board. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Donna. So what got you interested in working with elevators? I mean, That's did they fascinate you as a kid or something? Uh, no, not, not at all. Um, I actually uh, graduated and uh, my first job out of school was working in association property management in the uh, mid 90s. And, um, you know, it was a very demanding job. I was a portfolio manager, uh, so that meant I had multiple properties that I had to be at many places at the same time, dealing with many uh, type of issues. Um, and I said, man, there's got to be an easier way uh, to have a work life than have to multitask so many problems all at the same time with multiple evening meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually befriended uh, a sales rep who worked for Otis Elevator at one of the properties that I worked with. And uh, he had told me that he was leaving to go work at another company. Um, and I said, hey, can you put my name in the hat? And uh, that's how I kind of got into elevators. So, you know, for somebody who works in an industry for a long time, like you with elevators or me as an association attorney, often we think like there's nothing new under the sun, right? But you constantly see new things, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, in your industry. Yeah, I mean, elevators, when we first started, you know, they kind of told us that, you know, if an elevator is properly maintained, it'll last the life of the building. Um, and obviously, we've seen with you know, technology and technological obsolescence, you know, the sayings and the business philosophy uh, just, you know, 20 years ago has obviously greatly changed. What constitutes, Todd, a typical elevator modernization project? So we hear that a lot, and I know it's different from a repair project. So what is a modernization project? What does that entail? You know, the best way I can explain it is kind of uh, using analogies to the human body. So in an elevator modernization, there are four major components that uh, get replaced. Uh, the first being the controller, which I like to compare to the brain. Uh, the second being the fixtures, which are the buttons inside and outside of the elevator. Uh, then there's the door operator, which is kind of like the arms of the body. And then lastly um, is the heart, which is uh, in a hydraulic elevator system, which is an uh, oil system. Um, that's the pumping unit. Or for a traction elevator, that would be the hoist machine, which again, the analogy is kind of like the heart. Those four major components uh, are the major things that get changed in an elevator modernization and become most relatable to a board or a property manager because often they have never stepped foot in an elevator machine room or don't plan on stepping foot in the elevator machine room. So it kind of really helps explain to both them and their residents, you know, what they're really getting for this big dollar ticket item. But do you have to replace all four components for it to constitute a modernization project? Uh, no, uh, no, so the great question. Um, often uh, a modernization will happen for a variety of reasons. It could be because uh, the current provider or the manufacturer says that a component is now obsolete and now be, must be replaced and just that component must be done. Uh, it could be as part of the 40 year certification process. Um, but um, that being said, when you change the brains, uh, the controller, everything at that point must come up to current code. So um, you don't have to do all four, but if you change the controller, most if not all of those four major components uh, can be changed in some cases 
uh, for value engineering purposes, the one item that can kind of be a la carte out is the heart, uh, either the pumping unit or the uh, hoist machine. Um, but it, that, that really just depends on the unique, specific uh, circumstances. Often, also in an elevator modernization, it's probably done every 20 to 30 years. So in some of the buildings that we're working with, you know, the buildings were built in the 60s or 70s, and now in you know the year 2022, they're on their third time around of modernizing their elevators, where some of the components might not have been replaced the second time they modernized, um, but on the third time they need to. So, what's the typical downtime, Todd? If you're modern, let's take one elevator. What would be the downtime where that elevator would be out of service while you're while you're under, undertaking this project? You know, there's a general rule of thumb in the elevator industry that it's uh, roughly one week per floor it takes to uh, do an elevator modernization. But to be very clear and to really get a very important message across, that's only for the downtime of the actual performance of the work. So on a six-story building, uh, using that rule of thumb of one week per floor, you know, it's six weeks of inconvenience to residents. We've, you know, modernized successfully many uh, over 55 communities uh, where they only have one elevator. And we obviously understand the urgency to get that elevator running as quickly as possible. But what we found, uh, or I found over the last 20 plus years of doing this, is the real downtime. And the real thing that the associations really need to be taking into consideration is the lead time for the manufacturing of the equipment. Because if a service provider or a manufacturer says that, you know, the elevator can no longer work because one of these components has failed and there is no life use left, it's not just the, four, the, the six weeks of downtime to do the installation of the work, but this equipment must be custom made for each property. Uh, it, you know, not too long ago, the lead times uh, for some equipment on a hydraulic elevator could be four to six weeks and on traction equipment could be two to three months, but uh, as, as we obviously know what's been going on uh, in the economy and with logistics mm -hmm. and all of this stuff, you know, they've been doubled. So on that scenario of a, of a six story elevator, if they don't proactively prepare the financing, the bidding process, the manufacturing project, you know, that one elevator isn't down just for six weeks of installation time. It could be down for six, six months, nine months to get the lead times of all the equipment, which would be, you know, really a detrimental problem uh, for a single elevator building in particular. Well, I was going to ask you about buildings with just one elevator. So what what are those residents expected to do if it's six stories and you have elderly, perhaps disabled people living on the upper floors? Are they just expected to walk down to leave the building? Is Are there any other options? I don't know that you're going to have lifts or... Is there a temporary no. elevator you can put in or no? No, it's all about communication. Um, so the more that you can proactively handle it, and as I said earlier, you know, we've successfully done elevator modernization projects on many over 55 communities or properties with one elevator. And it's all about just properly communicating to the residents. Um, you know, that six story elevator is, is not the common of an over 55 community. Maybe it's four stories and it's four weeks and, you know, accelerated schedule and working some overtime, you know, if, you know, it's cost, if it's not cost prohibitive is an option, but regardless, you know, 24 hours or 48 hours of not having an elevator is, 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 you know, major issue in these communities. So again, we found successfully that over communicating to the residents, giving them enough advance notice, letting them know to go visit family members, to come up with alternative housing solutions. Uh, when boards and management companies do that, uh, you know, these um, projects uh, go off a lot better when, you know, an only elevator is so urgent for, you know, the residents. Well, preparation is key, and I wanted to ask you about so-called elevator consultants. Now, when, when people mention an elevator consultant, is that really just another name for somebody like you going out talking about your own company? Or is that an independent consultant that would come out and talk to a, a board or a manager about, you know, the different options, the different companies out there? Yeah, so uh, ele elevator consultants should be independent contractors. 
um, who basically should be educating their clients on the right customer centric solutions uh, moving forward. Obviously, when a developer builds a building, the residents and the board really have no say in what's going into their property. Um, so things like the, the conversation of proprietary versus non-proprietary equipment, the conversations of union versus non-union labor workforce, privately held companies versus publicly traded companies and the prices uh, associated with uh, those type of situations. Uh, the consultants uh, who would get hired by the board of directors uh, should be educating them on all those scenarios because in most cases, uh, otherwise, uh, the current elevator service provider will give a proposal. The management company will hope to get two or three other, hopefully, apples to apples bids. But often in our case, uh, it's found that they're not apples to apples, not because uh, the board or the elevator company uh, doesn't want it to do so, but just nobody really knows how to really true up and look at all three bids and make sure that all the components are quoted the same that a global manufacturer controller um, is any better or not better or what is the, the long-term best case scenario compared to these non-proprietary manufacturers that have been around for 20 or 30 or longer years. Um, the union versus non-union pros and cons of both installation schedule, cost structure. Um, so again, that's really where the valuable uh, value of a uh, consultant comes in to really have the lens of customer centric what's in the best interest of the client and not yeah. just you know the contractor selling what's uh, best for them to sell right his own services yeah it's very similar todd to what our clients use when they're looking um to negotiate a bulk cable contract or or internet you know there are telecom consultants that they will bring in independent they they are not selling the service but what they're selling is their expertise in kind of sitting with the board and helping them look through all the different options the different rates and the different tech out there so one of the biggest complaints i get though from so many of my clients is that there's not a lot of choices in florida and this may be true nationwide when it comes to elevator companies do you know how many elevator companies actually operate in Florida? Uh, I don't have the specific number. Uh, that's something that's uh, set up through the state of Florida elevator division. But for the argument of this conversation, we'll say it's a couple hundred. Um, they're all registered elevator companies through the state of Florida. You've got the four largest global manufacturers and you've got plenty of independent uh, contractors, both again, uh, union workforce, non-union workforce, um, privately held family owned companies like my own or uh, companies that are publicly traded or, you know, there's been a lot of new entrants to our market of private equity based. Um, but there is definitely a lot more options than most people think. It's almost very similar to the analogy I use of uh, an individual and who can service their car. There's this perception that, you know, if you have a Honda, uh, the Honda dealership is the only company that can service your elevator. Um, and for a variety of reasons, maybe that's the case. But especially after the manufacturer's warranty period expires, um, you know, there's you know, successfully many independent uh, car dealership or car repair shops or car service shops who are successfully able for a variety of reasons to be in business. Uh, and I, I like to compare that very similar to elevators and elevator maintenance and repair companies. Uh, compared to the analogy of thinking and, and again for the role of either consultants or management companies and having preferred vendors or qualified vendors but for sure there are definitely a lot more options than most people think it's just an awareness issue uh, absolutely and i'm so glad you mentioned that because you know listen in the intro i named the various very large companies elevator companies that you worked for i see the same elevator company names over and over and over again when my clients are, are considering either a, a modernization project or just a service contract. Um, speaking of contracts, I think the reason that, that, that we see so few names, you know, we keep seeing the same names over and over again, is because a lot of these companies really do lock in associations for decades with a particular company. I don't know if you're aware of the litigation years, it was decades ago, but it was somebody complaining about a particular 
lease and that it just had that automatic renewal that kept rolling over. And if you missed a very narrow uh, t window of opportunity to cancel, you rolled over for another decade or even 20 years. And, and I think a lot of times that's why associations don't think they have a choice, Todd, because they've been locked into these very long-term contracts. Now with your, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, but you know, they don't offer much flexibility in, oh, Okay, we're gonna. <laughs> so, sorry, John. You know what? I'm gonna have to put this on D and D. Okay. All right. Yeah, John, John. John warned me very well. Yeah. Yes. That's. You know what, John? Do me a favor. Email my assistant Carla and make sure she puts D and D on my on my calls, if you oh, could. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So let me let me go back to where I was. Sure. Oh, just waiting. Okay. Perfect. So where did I leave off, Todd? Uh, we were on the, we're, you're starting to go down the pipeline of the service. Oh, right, contracts. right, right. So so I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, Todd. How much flexibility do you offer with your, with your agreement? Because listen, as an association attorney, I will tell you, whatever you present to me, I'm not going to love. <laughs> and I'm going to want to make certain changes for my association client. I wouldn't expect, we're going to do it again. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, I wouldn't expect it any different, Donna. I mean, you brought up some, you know, examples earlier about the cable contracts, right? The cable contracts are known very long term. The washing machine uh, contracts, also historically known as very long term contracts. Uh, the elevator industry, by nature, is typically a, a five year agreement. Um, and why is it five years? I can't tell you, other than that's the way it's always been. But just because that's the way it's always been does not mean that's the way it needs to be moving forward. Uh, from my viewpoint, uh, contracts are supposed to be win-win scenarios. Uh, sometimes, you know, we'll get addendums from association attorneys and it's so one-sided that uh, we have issues. But I found that when two parties want to do business, uh, you find scenarios to create one win-win scenarios. So uh, in particular for my organization, um, we look to those type of scenarios. We are open-minded to any and all talking points to discuss, as long as it's under the premise of win-win scenarios. And uh, absolutely, our industry needs to have some shaking up uh, because there are uh, some bad feelings or bad experiences by clients and association attorneys with some of these contracts that roll over again and again. So absolutely, our industry uh, needs to change and hopefully is evolving in that regard. You know, I say that to vendors, Todd, because the reality is there's a lot of inertia with associations. And the bottom line is they're not looking to swap out vendors every other year. If you're doing a good job, they're going to stick with you. So I agree. What I agree. It's just good business to give that flexibility. And just as long as you're providing a good service, they're likely, you know, the board's likely to stick with you. Yeah, the only disclaimer I would put in there, Donna, is unlike certain uh, services where there real is no expensive uh, replacement cost of material, uh, with all due respect to a pool service contract or a grass cutting contract, um, there just needs to be some understanding uh, when it pertains to elevators, you know, because one component or, or board can cost a couple thousand dollars. So, um, again, uh, language, mutually beneficial, performance clauses, all of those type of uh, provisions should be in there to protect the association. So it's just not a, whatever the term contract, the association stuck and there are no deliverables that the, uh, the uh, service provider has to uh, you know, deliver to. So before we jump off modernization and switch to, to regular maintenance, I want to ask you, when you perform a modern when you modernize an elevator it's reasonable to expect that it's going to be faster right I, I mean i laugh but i mentioned to you earlier i'm from chicago um it was the sears tower when i grew up there and now it's called the willis tower but i feel like i could get to the top you know this is the 103rd floor sky deck quicker than i can get to the fifth floor in some of the buildings i visit so does a modernization project always result in a faster elevator um, for the average person, the answer would be no. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> you, you know, the changing of the heart on a traction elevator from a 
gear geared originally designed to a gearless uh, could make it uh, faster, but there are a lot more variables that have to go into play. Uh, and without getting too technical, um, there's space requirements for the some of the stuff. Um, so the ride quality is actually where residents would actually see the difference in a modernization. You know, for example, if the uh, hoist machine gets replaced from a gear to a gearless. Um, but you know, the better question that I'm often asked uh, by people is, you know, we're in a six-story uh, condominium, and the condominium where I live, the elevator is much slower than the six-story office building that I'm in. And how can that be? It seems to be so much faster at work. Well, the first question that I ask people, uh, because there's this assumption that a six-story elevator is a six-story elevator. Right. It's going up the same six stories, right? Right. But, you know, if it's a Class A office building, it's very well possible that that might be a gearless traction elevator that is designed to go at 300 feet per minute where the, the uh, elevator at the association might be a hydraulic elevator, which, you know, on average is designed to go at 150 feet per minute. So, you know, again, there's just this assumption that, you know, six story is six story, and it's not often the case. Uh, it's really more, you know, what the actual equipment is, a hydraulic retraction, and what was the end result that the client was looking for. And obviously, from a price point and, and, and moving of traffic, uh, of the bodies in a you know class A office building versus in a residential, you know maybe only elevator building, maybe it's not as relevant. Or you know how many elevators? Is one more problem free than the other? Hydraulic versus gearless? Uh, so or safer be, even? Uh, no, I mean listen, they're all uh, equally safe. They all have this uh, different code requirements and safety tests. Um, the uh, hydraulic system is more uh, a closed loop oil system, very similar to, uh, again, going back to car dealerships and the car lifts that the mechanic would put a car on. That was kind of like the original concept of where the hydraulic elevator concept came from. Uh, the traction elevators, um, you know, started back in, you know, with Elijah Otis back in the World Trade, uh, World Trade Fair and have evolved to a different mechanism, but gear gearless, traction it's basically a pulley system like a seesaw um and they've been around a long time they're very safe uh, components uh, it has more to do with again uh the speed the cost um those are really the drivers and again why it's so important um to have consultants or service providers that are really looking um especially in a modernization you know you know what's the right product for the customer and what they're trying to achieve I'm going to nerd really out on you. I'm going to nerd out yeah. on you a little bit here because this is really interesting to me. I've never thought about elevators so much as I was when prepping for today's episode. Can you, can you, if you had an association that had a hydraulic elevator system, could they switch during the modernization project to a gearless system? Is that even feasible? Uh, if there's enough room in the elevator hoistway, they would need to have enough room to where you're going to put the equipment. So we've seen conversions from, uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, I once worked uh, many years ago with a client in St. Petersburg, Florida, where remember, uh, traction elevators have been alert, alert, around much longer than hydraulic elevators. So uh, this one part particular project in St. Petersburg, they had a much older traction elevator that they wanted to modernize. And because it was so much more costly to modernize a traction elevator, uh, we were able to actually uh, give them a new elevator, but a hydraulic elevator. Um, you could go the other way um, and as well change a hydraulic to a traction, but there would be a lot of uh, boxes that would need to be checked um, to comply with code and, and, and other type of things. But um, anything is possible uh, depending on one's budget and uh, if there's not limitations in space. Right. And, and one's desires. So let's talk about maintenance. How often does an elevator need to be maintained and what's involved with that maintenance? So our industry uh, has historically defined that in the service contracts, and I'm sure uh, you love when you see it, as regularly and systematically. Um, right. The, what does that the, mean? <laughs> yeah, that means <laughs> to be held as little as accountable as possible. <laughs> Um, but, you know, to, to answer the specific question, the reality is it depends on the type of elevator. Is it a hydraulic elevator? 
There's an attraction elevator. How many stories is it? How many stories is it? And does the elevator open in the front or does it open in the front and rear? You know, a lot of the newer higher end buildings today. Now, you know, back in the day, you know, elevators would open to a common hallway. Some, they open to a unit, mm -hmm. but it's only for one unit and it opens in the front and rear. All of those different variables all impact how frequently, what the cost should be on top of there are code requirements. So to answer it as simplistically as possible, I would say that obviously regularly and systematically is not good language for a client to have. Um, but in the same breath, um, each elevator service company, depending uniquely on what they particularly have and the number of elevators, it, it should not be an issue to come up with some type of performance criteria of how often in hours per month per elevator, depending on the unique situation, so that there's some understanding. And I often like to use the analogy of grass cutting or pool service to get away from a per month fee into a per cut or a per, or a per service uh, understanding so that, you know, in, in pools, right? If it rains for an entire month, you know, do you still pay the contractor even though the, no one came for the month? Mm -hmm. So in the same breath, like an elevator service company shouldn't, you know, get paid for three months if they didn't go for three months. So there need, needs to be some check and balance. And so, you know, we'll often put um, in uh, contracts those type of criteria of a minimum preventative maintenance hours per month to tie into some price so that there's some uh, protection for the association to get away from, again, that trap of many years and not getting the, the level of service that they've been paying for. No, that makes sense. So, Todd, there's always regular updates to the building code, and those updates often pertain to elevators. I know a few years ago, elevators had to be retrofitted with uniform keys, and right now there's a pending December 31st, 23 deadline to install safety doors in all Florida elevators. How how is this communicated? How are these deadlines, other than people like me and association attorneys, so, you know, we will tell our clients and management companies will, but how is that information disseminated typically? Yeah, so the state um, basically adopts uh, the National Elevator Code. So in this particular case, uh, there was a change that had to do with the door lock monitoring. And so for, in most cases, the associations are not going to find out about this need for compliance until an annual inspection is done by a third-party elevator inspector who will then write up a violation to the association for not being in compliance. That is there a fine associated? I'm sorry, but is there a fine associated at that point? No. They, okay. took, they have 90 days to correct, okay. but it's going to be a costly repair, and there might be a backlog with if every single or if a large portion of elevators in the state of Florida need to do this, you know, those who are more proactive will obviously be ahead of it. So it's not pending. It's it's uh, by December 2023, uh, elevators that currently do not have door lock monitoring um, are going to need to have it to be in compliance. So there is also a lot of confusion, and we've seen some aggressive sales tactics by some companies um, on which elevators will need to be in compliance, which ones won't. The most two simplistic ways to help associations get the answer that they need is two things. One, if the original manufacturer, i.e. the controller manufacturer, is still in business, ask them for a letter in writing to state that their particular elevator has that feature. Um, now, in some cases, we've seen some clients uh, ask us because for whatever reason, those manufacturers are being very slow in responding. Um, but that is obviously one way to do it. But you know, in some cases, we've actually had clients because they've been frustrated um, with companies not giving them the answers that they need, then they've asked us to test it for them. And there's an actual test that you can do, just like the inspectors want to do, to confirm that the feature is actually operational or not. So Todd, what's the feature? I just have to stop you because you oh, just explain what the, I know it's a safety door, but can you explain how it operates? Well, basically the door lock monitoring is to prevent uh, circuitry from being jumped for other reasons. Uh, 
the most simplistic way of saying it is it's basically done to prevent elevator mechanics from doing certain things that would prevent the functionality of operating correctly. And there's obviously a reason why this has gone into effect because certain things happen to individuals that we never want to have happen again. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's actually a perfect segue into what I said at the outset in the introduction that some people actually have phobias about using elevators. I know a few people who will not use elevators. They will only use the stairs. And, you know, thankfully, we don't hear often about fatalities associated with the use of elevators, but it happens. Have you personally seen, I think you were just alluding to that a minute ago, have you, have you seen um, fatalities, unfortunately, over the course uh, of your career? I mean, I personally haven't uh, seen them. Uh, they have happened here. They have happened in other markets. It's a terrible thing. And, um, you know, the elevator industry um, in that regard is very much um, a tight community that when accidents, let alone fatalities occur, I mean, nobody wants to see that. So, you know, on during the day, we're all in the field. We're all competing against each other, trying to take business from one another. Um, but, you know, when there's an accident or, you know, God forsake a fatality, I mean, it's devastating, obviously, to uh, the entire industry. And we all don't want to see that happen. So it is all about education, safety, and making sure that certain uh, codes are passed to try to prevent that stuff from ever happening again. What I've only seen is people stuck in elevators. So can you, you're stuck in an elevator. I assume pushing every button is not the answer. What's the first thing you do if you're stuck in an elevator? Take a big deep breath. <laughs> I like that advice. Okay, and after you take a big deep breath, what you push all the, the buttons. You press the one that has got the picture <laughs> next to it with the elevator phone, and hopefully somebody responds. <laughs> If somebody doesn't respond, you then take out your cell phone and you call whoever you need to call or you hit the alarm button. Uh, but the reality is someone is going to respond and someone is going to safely get you out. But um, the best people and the most trained people to get you safely out of the elevator is going to be 911. So, you know, we often work with clients or management companies and we're off, you know, back in the day, every building used to have one of those door retrieval keys that was able to get someone out of the elevator. But I have seen myself personally where I've been involved with, uh, you know, helping explain how certain things occur that can be avoided. And those keys that the people used to have shouldn't be in anyone's possession. So when someone gets stuck, if you're inside the elevator, big deep breath, call, hit the alarm, someone is going to notify you know, the fire department or 911 to get the appropriate personnel properly trained to safely get you out. But you're going to be safe in the elevator. You just got to relax and wait for the proper person to retrieve you. And if you're on the other side of the elevator, and if you're not a properly trained and you're not the fire department, you need to call 911 and again, help and communicate with the person inside the elevator so that if someone does have anxiety issues or whatever it is, be there with them, communicate with them, keep them calm until the appropriate parties get there. But the appropriate trained personnel needs to be the only personnel to get those people out. You heard it here first, folks. Let's lay a, a myth to rest. They are not going to run out of air in the elevator cab. There is airflow, correct? Absolutely. There's, <laughs> okay. exhaust, there's, a, there's both an exhaust fan and there's uh, grills uh, that allow the flow of uh, air. So even if you're stuck in there for much longer than you anticipated, you're not going to run out of oxygen. Nope, there might not be the right music. There might not be any music. <laughs> you might not get cell phone service, and you might not be able to, you know, watch something on your cell phone to keep you company. And you might not like who you're stuck with in the elevator, but you're not gonna you're not gonna suffocate. There will and be air, and you will be safe. So, Todd, I know the standard protocol, because we do this even drills in our building, is never use an elevator in the event of an emergency, such as a fire. But are there any exceptions to that rule where an elevator will get you out of a building quicker? Or is the standard uh, rule, no, regardless of anything, you, do, you walk, you don't take the elevator? Yeah, you, you walk and you take the stairs. That's why they have the code signs at every floor and engraved all over the place in case of fire. Take the stairs uh, because the second 
that uh, a, a smoke sensor goes off or otherwise, those elevators are going to be triggered and they are going to recall to the first floor or the appropriate uh, landing that it needs to get to. And it will not be able to go back into operation until the properly trained personnel, in most cases the fire department, inserts, as you uh, mentioned earlier, those universal fire service keys. And then they will take control of the elevator uh, in phase one, either in the lobby or in phase two inside the elevator. But um, yes, take the stairs. Got it. Got it. So you mentioned earlier about, you know, consistent upgrades, consistent. um, Okay, we're going to cut that part. You mentioned earlier about consistent upgrades. There's a group called the American Society of Mechanical Engineers or ASME. Is that the entity that makes these suggestions? Uh, they're actually the body that uh, cre- created the original elevator code, and they make the uh, adoptions uh, of uh, upgraded code requirements. Then it is the state's responsibility to adopt or accept them. And in some markets, like New York or Chicago, uh, local municipalities might have above and beyond different uh, or greater adoptions that they might accept. But yes, that organization is basically the governing body that uh, comes up with the uh, code changes that they then present for adoption at the different jurisdictions. How do you get on that board? Uh, That's a great question and way outside my technical um, (laughs) pay grade. Is it people people selling elevator parts who are on that board? No, 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 absolutely not. (laughs) Absolutely not. So some of my communities, Todd, they require the use of a Shabbos or Sabbath elevator. And for our listeners who've never heard that term before, can you explain how those elevators work? And I should say, in my communities that use them, it's normally one elevator out of many that they that they, you know, install this component in. Yeah. So the Sabbath operation has to do with uh, buildings where they have uh, observant uh, Jewish population, and it goes into the concept of where a, a person or individual who wants to use the elevators is supposed to be touching anything of power or electricity. So the Sabbath operation feature would allow the operate to kind of the elevator to kind of operate on its own. Um, in the older systems to accomplish that, uh, we've seen all kinds of uh, MacGyvering or uh, jerry-rigging of systems where you know they would take a sprinkler uh, clock with a manual uh, flip of a switch and to, to get it going and then when the, the Sabbath was over, they'd turn the switch off and it would stop functioning. Uh, on the newer systems, obviously, they're uh, very much more software driven, so they can be programmed with date and time so people don't have to run to the machine room to get it going and not get it going. But basically, in concept, the feature is uh, someone would be able to enter from the first floor or the lobby, and the elevator will stop floor by floor by floor all the way up and floor by floor all the way on the way down so that the person Uh, At the lobby does not need to press the hall button. Um, The person then would not have to go inside the elevator and press their particular floor. It eventually will get to their floor. And conversely, a person who was in their unit who needed to get down or move inside the building uh, would equally be able to enter not at their floor, would not have to hit the button, get inside the elevator, would not have to hit a button. Now, um, the reason why often it only happens on one elevator in a building is because it now greatly slows down the traffic flow right. uh, for the rest of the building. Because it's just, it's going to every floor continually for what, eight hours? Just stopping on every floor? Oh, well, it's from s- basically sun down to sun down. So, so it's 12, 12 hours. 12 hours. 12 yeah. hours. Just right, right. Yeah, you better not have one elevator or, I mean, unless you're in a very tiny building, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a feature that is required um, in some buildings. And, that, and what we've described is kind of a standard feature. Uh, we've uh, very rarely, but uh, run in some clients uh, who come from the Northeast who have a different interpretation or want a, uh, a more extreme interpretation of how it functions. Uh, and on the newer systems, they can be custom programmed, uh, obviously for an additional, additional feature and cost. But um, 
for the most part, that's kind of how it works in concept that the passenger doesn't need to press any buttons and the elevator will operate. And you really don't want it going longer than 12 hours because you think about the additional wear and tear it sure. puts on the elevator working in that type of functionality for 12 hours straight. Well, you mentioned technology, and I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, listen, we're we're kind of got the pandemic in our rear view mirror, but it's still lingering. We still have it, but it's not the same. But I will. Re I remember back in early 2020, our phones were ringing off the hook with boards, you know, trying to figure out which amenities they needed to shut down. And, you know, this is pre-vaccine. And of course, those communities that had elevators, this was a huge, huge issue because a lot of times you're talking about a very tiny space. And we wanted people wearing masks. Some people were even wearing gloves. Back then, remember, we were wiping down groceries. Nobody knew yeah. exactly whether or not it was transmissible, um, you know, on surfaces. So what what kind of technology is kind of on the horizon? Or I should start by saying, what kind of technology came out of the pandemic? I would imagine touchless, right, where people don't have to push buttons? Uh, it, that came a little late. Uh, there were some companies that did everything from foot pedals uh, in lieu of having to touch the buttons. Uh, you know, we saw people who were buying on Amazon these little keys, uh, these metal keys, so they didn't have to touch the button. But it was creating other issues because they were cracking the plastic buttons. I have um, one, Todd. Don't mock yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, It was given to me. I didn't buy yeah, it. It was given yeah, to me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we saw that kind of stuff. Um, the most um, common thing that most people, other than obviously the basics of wearing gloves, and I myself at one point was wearing gloves uh, to touch the buttons, uh, was basically to do with the air uh, quality. Um, so a lot of companies came out with different types of air purification uh, systems that tied into uh, the, the, the fans inside the elevator and all that stuff. But uh, to be honest, uh, it's been many months, if not over a year, where really that curiosity of what's out there and what we're going to do, uh, it's really kind of uh, teetered down. I'm wondering if we're ever going to have like an Alexa type situation in elevators where you can just say, take me to a, a floor and have it voice uh, activated. Yeah, early on, uh, we were asked by a client to do some research on that and we did. Um, and there was a particular company in Europe uh, that had uh, such a product. Um, and upon doing my due diligence uh, and asking if they had any uh, United States installations, the answer, unfortunately, was no. Um, but, you know, we started to, you know, pop some holes in some of the technology uh, with a non global production company like an Amazon. So Amazon, if you're listening, maybe there is something for you. <laughs> but uh, for this particular company uh, who is using their product, uh, if you think about it, there are so many dialects, so many accents just here in South Florida alone uh, that, you know, I have a hard time um, sometimes just uh, voice texting uh, and the phone understanding who I am that uh, I, I think it's going to take some major dollars and or if ever possible to really get, uh, you know, what makes, you know, South Florida so unique uh, with all the different accents and, and languages to to get the uniform uh, language uh, to get that to kind of work. You make a you make a fair point. Do you have a I imagine you have a, a tr uh, industry trade show or, you know, a couple times a year, perhaps, where you go and find out what new technology is out there, what's emerging? Yeah, uh, next week at the uh, National Elevator uh, Show, once a year. Look at that. Where is it Where is it this year? Uh, this year it's in Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. Well, before we move into uh, electric vehicle charging stations, which is a really big topic with a lot of my clients right now, is there anything I didn't ask you, Todd, about elevators that I should have asked you? Uh, scary enough, you asked me more than I thought you were going to ask me, so uh, <laughs> you are uh, very more well-versed on the topic, uh, probably for unfortunate reasons, but uh, fortunately your clients um, are lucky to have you in that regard because <laughs> you've uh, obviously uh, already had your battle wounds on what you need to look out for um, in our industry, so uh, no, you uh, definitely... 
covered a, a very good All ground right. basis. That's great. So let's talk about electric vehicle charging stations. You, if I understand this correctly, you're, you've recently gotten into this space. What are you, what are you doing with them? Uh, you know, a lot of our clients uh, basically started asking me, you know, hey, this is kind of similar to elevators uh, or, you know, what do you know about it? So by the third or fourth time, I kind of said, you know what, I got to do a little more due diligence here. So I put a team together and um, we're basically working uh, with a separate uh, entity, uh, Connection, Connections Charging. Um, and basically, we are helping associations more in an owner's rep capacity, kind of like an elevator consultant, to make sure that they're understanding the long-term needs of their residents, um, both from a hardware perspective, um, what's required on the electrical upgrading side, because there's a lot of moving components that with associations with limited funds, we want to make sure that they're doing this properly, you know. It's almost, again, like the analogy of what happened originally when buildings started to go with hurricane shutters. And, you know, at one point, there, you know, every unit owner just went at it and they did their own thing. And then there was uniformity issues amongst other issues. So I'm trying to take, you know, my 20 plus years of dealing with associations and with elevators from property management and, you know, try to proactively help these clients in trying to avoid some of the landmines um, from other uh, industries, uh, because there's no doubt, and I've not found one person who's going to tell me that this is not the future, right? Electric cars is the future. It's already here. Um, and where a couple years ago I had been asked about it and kind of thought about it, uh, there's no doubt. I mean, it is the most common topic of conversation at any and every building that I'm at. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the law changed a few years ago, Todd, where now an association cannot prohibit someone in Florida from installing their own electrical vehicle charging station in their assigned parking space or their pertinent parking space. But, you know, the association can create a framework around that installation. And I prepare a restrictive covenant for my association clients to use. But it sounds to me like you're working a lot with associations who want to install a common area station, right? With multiple charging stations where it's the association who is doing the installation, not an individual owner. Yeah, there are uh, a handful of clients that are thinking it more long-term and really making the significant investment to address it for each individual unit owner. Um, but for mostly budgetary purposes, and to kind of crawl before running, uh, most clients are trying it in some type of more common area versus a limited area uh, spot to give uh, to, to try it because you know it is costly. Uh, this is a costly investment, uh, particularly with the electrical upgrades and the electrical work that needs to be done. To, you can't just you know take the charger and plug it into a, you know a regular outlet. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of due diligence that goes into this. Uh, you know, we've had to bring in, in some cases, FPNL, we have to bring in electrical engineers, we got to do some analysis of uh, existing electrical infrastructure, you know, and where are these spaces, where are these spots going to go? Because ideally, you want the chargers as close to the meter room or the electrical room as possible to minimize cost. So, there's a lot of due diligence and legwork that goes in. And it, uh, again, very similar to an elevator modernization or elevator maintenance. Unfortunately, it's all unique. There is no simple answer. You know, every time you've got to go to the property and you've got to do a site survey and really understand from the client what their objectives are. But again, no doubt it's uh, becoming more and more common of a thing. And we're just trying to get people as quick as possible up to speed uh, while we're getting educated on it because, you know, technology is, is moving fast. Well, well, and our, listen, our legislature supports this because they passed a bill basically saying associations, you cannot prohibit this. They want to encourage people to start using you know, electric vehicles. But you mentioned technology. How do you prevent today's technology from being obsolete in a few years? You, you mentioned Europe just a few minutes ago in the technology with elevators. I read that, that they have in some spots um, the actual parking space that you drive into is is charging the vehicle. So, to, you know, today, how do you prevent today's, uh, you know, technology that they're installing from being absolutely obsolete in a few short years? 
Um, so that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, we took the approach of coming in more as an owner's rep uh, than an installer ourselves, because, you know, we don't want to get stuck having equipment and being the company that owned a bunch of VHSs as CDs came to market, right? Um, and, you know, you know, we talk about Amazon and yes, you know, you can go YouTube and you can see how Amazon today has warehouses full of robots and the robotic machines self-charge themselves. You know, I've had some healthy uh, debates with some individuals that carless, uh, driveless, driverless vehicles is the future. Um, so, you know, when is the future? When is that? Um, we don't know. That could be 30 years from now. That could be 25 years from now. I love my parents. My parents still have never used an ATM card. So, um, I don't think mine yeah. have either. So, <laughs> Yeah, so there's always going to be some demographic that's not going to be adopting some of this stuff or will adopt it at a much slower pace. Um, but what we've done and, and what I firmly believe in, it's all about the customer. So, you know, we've really done our due diligence. We're working with one particular car manufacturing charging company now where using the experience from before and from all the years, um, we basically structured agreements that basically protect the association. So uh, when a charging, a charging station is installed, between the maintenance and or if software or modifications evolve and there needs to be an upgrade, it's all included in the maintenance agreement. Mm -hmm. Because again, especially associations, which are non-for-profit uh, buildings, you know, they can't afford, you know, this nickel and dime uh, concept. Right. So um, that's the approach that we're working with so far. And so far it's uh, getting a lot of traction and uh, clients are really uh, intrigued by it. So that's the path we're going. And we believe firmly that that's the right long-term solution for the client. Well, that does make sense. You were in the management industry. You were a regional president at the Continental Group, which is the predecessor to First Service Property Management. And you and I have been talking throughout this episode about, you know, associations hiring companies to handle their elevators. And now we're talking about electric vehicle charging stations. What did your experience in the management industry teach you about how volunteer boards and managers evaluate their choice of vendors? By the way, I have very definite ideas on this because I think I my experience tells me that they evaluate vendors on price. They 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 overly rely on how much is it going to cost. But I want to hear your experience. Yeah, I mean you're kind of spot on, right? You know, often in the uh review process that they, you know, go from, you know, to that last page and what's the price. Um, and that's a very dangerous uh, situation sometimes, right? Uh, penny wise, pound foolish. Um, but, you know, I think just backing up, I think big picture, you know, the associations need, you know, unbiased advice, uh, especially when it comes to specialized technology type things. You know, it's it's unfair. I think it's unrealistic to expect, you know, uh, residents to expect the property manager all of a sudden to be a subject matter expert and or a board of directors um, to be experts in all facets. So, you know, they really need to count on these subject matter experts who are truly customer centric, who are really thinking long term for their client, you know, who are really focused uh, equally, uh, not just what's best for their client, but for the reputation of not just the consultants, but the, the contractors. You know, I've, I've worked very hard over the last 20 plus years uh, focusing on my reputation, my long term reputation, both in the community and the industry. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I've seen over the years, especially when there's new products or new concepts, you know, there's a handful of new companies that will enter, you know, the South Florida market, you know, with a lot of marketing dollars to spend that uh, will often get traction with new clients until attorneys get involved. And hopefully uh, attorneys are involved uh, before to look at the contracts and make sure there's non-performance provisions, which unfortunately sometimes there's not. And that's why we talked about what we talked about earlier. Um, but, you know, we just like you want to see people avoid the mistakes that have happened in the past, right? It doesn't matter the industry, but so between the overpricing or not delivering on service of goods, you know, we just want to help 
make sure that clients are going to truly unbiased subject matter, transparent experts in an industry to guide them for the right long-term solutions. If the association, uh, as like we said earlier, goes to the last page and only cares about the price, uh, even if that's the short-term solution, you know, that's ultimately the buyer's uh, decision. But, you know, we're going to try to guide them with what the right long-term solution, and maybe that's not the right solution for that particular client, and maybe we're not the right fit um, in, in whatever uh, avenue we're trying to assist them. But that's that's the methodology that you know I've really focused on in my career um, and, and we think is important, especially with some of this very costly technological stuff. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, Todd, is give yourselves time. So if you're doing anything in a rush or a panic because you've waited to the last minute, uh, you, your choices are going to be limited and you're probably not going to make as good a choice as if you'd let you know, allowed yourself some some months for lead time to, as you said, really search out those subject matter experts, really do your due diligence, figure out what you want in terms of the technology, in terms of the particular vendors that are available to you. Just give yourself time. Absolutely agree. As we discussed earlier with the elevator modernizations, when you uh, have an only elevator and you proactively do it versus reactively, you have a lot more time to make uh, emotionally intelligent decisions. Well, speaking of time, I've kept you almost an hour, and I'm so grateful for the time that you've given. I just want to end with one question. As you know, a very close source has told me that you are an excellent tennis player and that you represented the U.S. in Israel's Maccabea games. i got to ask, what was that like? That's kind of cool. Uh, it was beyond amazing. Uh, you know, I come from a family of tennis players. Uh, my father's 81 years old. He played collegiate tennis in University of Miami. My brother played at the University of Delaware. So, you know, it was a beyond amazing experience uh, for my father, my brother and I, uh, each to proudly represent the United States uh, in the summer's uh, games. Uh, you know, it's basically the Jewish Olympics. Uh, most people don't know, uh, I didn't know until uh, we qualified and competed that uh, it's the third largest international sporting event in the world. Um, wow, how many countries participated? I want to say 85. 80? And you represent, and your dad represented the U.S. too at this? Uh, my dad not only represented, but he uh, proudly, and if anyone sees him walking around Miami with his bronze <laughs> medal, he will let you wear it and take a picture with it. Um, that yeah, is fantastic. He, Congrats, Mr. Schwartz. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, definitely is super stoked about that. But uh, to, to be to answer specifically your question, you know, the most amazing part was, you know, there was an opening ceremony. There was 20,000 cheering fans, uh, including uh, President Joe Biden. Um, and so to walk on the stage uh, through the tunnel on the stage with my dad and my brother in front of everybody, including, you know, my wife and my children, and children's boyfriends. Uh, it was uh, a lifetime experience that uh, hopefully we will get to uh, do again in another four years. Well, that's fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much, Todd, for joining us today. You've really, really imparted a lot of knowledge about elevators. My pleasure. And thank electric you. vehicle charging stations. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me as a guest. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. We're out there. Can you go oh, back sorry. and start over because I wasn't recording Okay, sure. Sorry. Okay, so what other technological innovate? Now, let me start. I'm going to say, so what other innovations are out there? Yeah, we're finding um, with time, um, things are advancing. So we've seen everything from what they call destination dispatch, where no longer when you go to the lobby, do you just press an up or Hold down Hold on a button. second. John, we can hear you typing. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I am so <laughs> sorry. I forgot to mute myself. That is totally my fault. OK. OK. Sorry, we're going to do this. Start ever. I will mute myself. OK. So what other innovations are out there? So um, great question. Uh, we're finding uh, you know, that all of a sudden in the last couple of years, uh, there's a lot of new technological uh, enhancements to our industry. Uh, everything from destination dispatch, where the traditional way of uh, going to the first floor and pressing an up or down button. Now you tell some, you touch a screen and you say what floor you're going to, uh, and then it'll tell you which elevator to go to as opposed to the more traditional way. Uh, we're now seeing uh, a lot of demand because a lot of the newer buildings now have 
um, touch screen like an iPad inside the elevator. We call those basically touch screen uh, car operating panels. So a lot of the modernization projects, we're seeing that type of technology. Um, and then we're also seeing the video screens, uh, very similar to a lot of uh, in the hotels uh, that you would see in other travels where you might see the weather or uh, the stock market uh, information. Um, but associations are actually asking not as much for live uh, information screens, but a lot of the managers uh, will get it and appreciate it so that they no longer, uh, instead of having to post, you know, a notice that they have to put, you know, the building and shut down a water line and have the maintenance staff go to every single floor and knock on every door and do stuff like that, that uh, these screens inside the elevators will allow to put information uh, in a much quicker, uh, much more time efficient uh, way. And, and much more aesthetically pleasing way to have it on a screen as opposed to a piece of paper tacked on the wall. Which digital graphics and, you know, all that kind of cool stuff. So, you know, we can put the logo in the background. We can, you know, do all kinds of real cool things and have rotating pictures of, you know, some of the upgrades that the building's done. Uh, so for sure, it's definitely a, a lot more aesthetically pleasant and more modern. I have a suggestion. Aromatherapy in the elevators has anyone mentioned that before or am i the first uh i know i personally love it when i walk into some buildings and i get that smell and i go wow and it takes you to that place uh, i haven't seen it in an elevator yet so somebody out there who's listening please call somebody's me. gonna make a fortune on this suggestion i just made oh, might well. be me Thank you, Donna. <laughs> you're welcome okay so that's good we'll cut that in okay john and by the way, um, Todd, I know somebody who would have loved to go to the Maccabea games, but he wasn't good enough. Uh, that's not true. You don't know unless you, 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 you don't know unless you try out. He has an eye thing. He keeps saying that he can't see. I don't know if it's um, because he had the he had the LASIK twice. Right. So he's having like distance issues now. Uh, it may just be I, it may just be a convenient disclaimer for his game. I don't know. That, that he had no vision problems playing on Saturday. He played, fan, he played fantastic. So I, call, I I would call bullshit on that. I am kind of, but I, I have to do it low key. Anyhow, thanks again. I really appreciate this. By the way, if you you should use it.